Earlier this month, I was in Hawaii with my family, and shortly before going on a canoe ride, it got me terribly sick, so sick that after the canoe ride, I was like laying on the beach for a while. I literally think some people thought I was dead. They had one step short of throwing sand on me. I cannot go on a canoe ever again. I told my wife, I will never film another video about Elizabeth Holmes. And she said, why? And I said, it's been done. It's been overdone. It's been talked about too much. I don't want to do it. A friend of mine produced the Hangover films. And I said to him one time, did you really need to make Hangover 3? Besides the money you made, probably not. So I felt like it was overdone. And as quickly as I said that to my wife and after I recovered from the canoe experience, by the way, there's the canoe experience behind me, my little boy rafting on, little boy working on the canoe. He's good. I was not. As soon as I said that to my wife, I begin getting text messages a couple of days later from people who follow White Color Advice on YouTube. And by the way, I'm so grateful that that you're here. So if you are here, please consider liking and subscribing, sharing and comment, whether you think this is good or bad. So a number of people on YouTube, uh, White Collar Advice and TikTok, White Collar Advice began reaching out like, are you going to cover it? Are you going to cover it? And I'm like, man, I am on vacation in Hawaii for eight days with my family, chasing two kids around. I am not going to talk about Elizabeth Holmes in prison and if she's wearing khakis or a green suit and how long she is visiting. And they're like, no, 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 there's more information to cover. I'm like, damn, I said, I will never cover it again. Yet here I am because I sense an opportunity to teach. And I know she's in prison. And unless she has an iPhone and is going rogue, I know she ain't watching it. But I know some defendant who's scared, traversing the system, who wants to do the work, who wants the shorter sentence, who wants to accept responsibility, who wants to make amends, who wants to prove worthy of the love and support of their family, who wants to become better than the worst decisions they ever made. I know you are watching this either live or at some point in the future. So this video is for you. And I pray to God that it helps you because when I was in your shoes, I needed it besides a punch to the face so I could get it together. So while I was in Hawaii, I began receiving messages from people saying, hey, man, uh, apparently her lawyers are going to the judge, Judge Davila, and the, the lawyers are asking judge not to apply a $250 a month restitution payment upon her release from prison. And when I heard that, I thought people were messing with me and they were not appreciating the fact that I was in vacation in Hawaii having a good time. But it turned out to be very real. When I read it, I was sad and disgusted and appalled because it continues to show that Elizabeth Holmes, and I had to put up a lengthier blog to this on whitecolloradvice.com that you could read. It proves that Elizabeth Holmes, till this day, even as she's standing for count in federal prison, crying while visiting with her family, as so many prisoners do, still shows she does not understand the stakeholders. Who are they? I will tell you. Myriad stakeholders in this system. Federal judge is a stakeholder. Probation officer is a stakeholder. Case manager in prison with whom she sees every single day is a stakeholder. U.S. attorney. Her victims, also stakeholders. Something all of you need to embrace if you are a federal defendant, these stakeholders do not care about you. They don't care about me. When I met my business partner, Michael Santos, who was serving a 45-year federal prison sentence in prison, right when I met him, I'm like, dude, my life is falling apart. I have no money left. My reputation is ruined. How am I ever going to make three cents again? This is awful. My mom's in therapy. She visits when she, she cries when she visits. And he's like, it's all about you, Justin. I never hear you talk about the victims, my man. Until you think about growing your network, providing value to the outside world, this will amount to a life sentence. You are not changing and you are in prison when you are supposed to change. And I'm like, aha, that was my aha moment that my business partner, Michael Santos, gave me. Elizabeth Holmes needs her aha moment quickly because she does not understand that the judge, the case manager, the prosecutor, they do not care about her. They care about the people who have had no success in their life, no opportunity in their life, mirrored in struggle and poverty and homelessness and depression and poverty and suicide and intergenerational recidivism where so many people come in, in and out of the system. Those are the people the prison system really wants to correct, yet she doesn't identify with them. They do not care about her, yet she continues to make choices that put herself first. And the irony of the title of this video is, where I call it Elizabeth Holmes prioritizing self-interest over responsibility in prison. The tragic irony is by prioritizing her own self-interest, she's actually making matters worse. If she truly had her interest at heart, she would consider the stakeholders. So all of this originated again because her lawyers went to the judge and asked that she not pay $250 a month in, in prison. 
And think about that for a moment as we transition into this, this blog. The disparity between spending and pain. I'll explain. I presume Elizabeth Holmes is getting $500 a month in federal prison. Her family is sending that to her. That's kind of what it costs to live well there. $360 a month in the commissary, email, five cents a minute, stamps and other items, phone when they charge again for that. So it's going to be 500 bucks a month to live well in prison that her family is sending to her. Yet she cannot, apparently 11 years from now, or seven and a half years when she is released, she is unable to pay at least half of that to her court-ordered restitution. Think about that for a moment. How do you think, as I wrote in this blog, how must her case manager in prison feel knowing she spends a considerable amount to live comfortably in prison, yet opposes a reasonable payment towards her massive judgment? $500 a month to live well there in custody that she is receiving, yet doesn't articulate to anyone, of course I'm going to pay this. I have 135 months to figure it out. I am measurably ahead of most other prisoners who are at one time not a billionaire and have Hulu and TV shows about them. New York Times ain't featuring them. They're featuring me. I probably have opportunities to find a way to make money and pay $250 a month. We talk about the disparity between spending and paying. Let's also assess the alleged $30 million that she owes or has paid to lawyers. She can pay the lawyers $30 million, apparently, yet no emphasis, no priority, no care, no accepting of responsibility, even if she is appealing, no emphasis on the victims, as rich as they may be, no consideration that, yes, I should make this minimum payment, even though I disagree, because if she truly cared about her self-interest, which all of us do, whether we admit it or not, you know what she would say to her lawyers? I'll pay it. I'll find a way to pay $500 a month. A thousand dollars a month. I want to convey to the stakeholders, whether even though I disagree with the indictment, I want to convey to the stakeholders that I identify with people who are harmed in this fraud. I want to express that I am no different than any other prisoner. I want to articulate that most prisoners don't even have resources to pay their restitution. That's why they work six jobs in prison. It's the reason their family visits with them once every six months, why they're saving that money to send it to the prisoner so that prisoner can pay the restitution. I don't want to be treated any differently. That prisoner doesn't complain about the restitution. Why should I? Plus, they work six jobs in prison and their family comes every six months. So there's no introspection. There's no thought. And in making short sighted decisions that she thinks helps her, it ends up getting her further away from what she wants, which is getting the hell out of prison as quickly as possible. For example, Trump, whether you like him or not, passed the First Step Act in 2018. And there are people in prison like Adam Clausen, who had a 213-year federal prison sentence, who was released after 20 years in prison because his judge determined that he was extraordinary and compelling, that he had earned it. Let's think about Judge Devilla for a moment, Elizabeth Holmes' sentencing judge. Do you think it hurts or helps Elizabeth Holmes if three or four years from now she applies from prison for a compassionate release because of the First Step Act, demonstrating why she's extraordinary, demonstrating why her case is so compelling, demonstrating why this law should apply to her? Do you think it helps or hurts her if she submits that application and Judge DeVille is thinking, you have got to be kidding me. Is this some sort of joke? Didn't your lawyers come to me four years ago? articulating that you couldn't afford to pay $250 with the sick, tragic irony. How much do you think she paid her lawyers that day to go to that hearing? She probably paid $20,000 or racked up $20,000 in legal fees for her lawyers to say she couldn't have paid $250. Think about that for a moment. There is no way a judge could see that she is extraordinary and compelling if she is dismissive of a modest $250 a month payment when she owes $452 million. Now, I have articulated before, it is not her family's responsibility to pay the $452 million. It's not their responsibility, but this is what a probation officer, an eventual stakeholder will express to her. Miss Holmes, I understand your fiance and family are not responsible for the $452 million. However, they did send you commissary in prison. They do help put a roof over your home. They do help subsidize your children's health care. Since they are helping you, is it that crazy to think that they cannot help subsidize a $250 a month restitution payment? Imagine the atmospherics of that for a moment. 
She's home from prison. She's meeting with her probation officer. Guess what everyone wants on federal probation? I can tell you because yours truly was on federal probation for three years. You know what you want? You want to work for yourself. You want to be an entrepreneur. You want to travel. You want to build a business. You don't want to have to get a minimum wage job. All work is honorable, but you prefer to have a job that they're going to approve. Is it more likely, I would ask Elizabeth Holmes, if she's listening to this right now in the federal prison camp yard, is it more likely, Elizabeth, that your probation officer is going to approve your travel and working as an entrepreneur if you say, of course, I'm going to make my court ordered restitution. Of course, I'm going to pay as much as possible. A strategy that helped me when I came home from prison because I had restitution, $500,000. My judge in my sentencing hearing said $500 a month or 10% of your income. And I said, of course, I will pay that. Of course I will. I made payments in prison. Then when I came home, my probation officer, because I was truly flat broke, said, I'm not going to hit you with $500 a month. You ain't got it. Send 100. But when I began to make more money, I wouldn't send 100. I'd send 500. When I'd go to Penn State or USC or KPMG to get paid three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 to speak, I would turn the whole honorarium over to restitution. And my probation officer said, very few people do that. I'm impressed. Guess what happened? More liberties, more traveling easier time on probation, no problemos. So if her goal is to be successful and to try to get out of prison early by way of a compassionate release or get off probation earlier or get as much time as possible on the halfway house, I would tell her, Elizabeth, you continue to make short-sighted, selfish decisions that get you further away, which is of most value to you, your family and your freedom. I think it is terrible. Further, as I wrap up this live video, I have a couple of more points here I'm gonna convey. I wrote here, Holmes' lack of perspective and the consequences of avoiding responsibility in prison. It's worth emphasizing that many individuals with fewer resources and no family support manage to make their restitution payments and do not complain. Many of these people were never billionaires and didn't have the resources to give tens of millions of dollars to lawyers. It's not just the payment size that matters, it's the principle. By refusing to pay even modest restitution, Holmes appears to avoid taking responsibility for the harm she caused. I am going to say it again before I go to the last point of this live video. There is someone in prison right now because I served time in federal prison doing six jobs, scrubbing toilets, doing pots and pans, educating themselves, preparing to go home. Most likely a, could be a nonviolent uh, drug offender who still owes restitution or fines or court-ordered fees. Doing this work yet finding a way to make a payment. How do you think they feel when they read an article stating that Elizabeth Holmes would not make her $250 a month payment? It is, it is sickening. It is disrespectful. It would be offensive to every prisoner. And it's something I cannot believe her lawyers encouraged her to do. Now, in true Elizabeth Holmes form, she would probably argue, hey, I'm in prison. I didn't know what they were doing. It's kind of back to the Balwani Theranos example. It's everybody else's fault but mine. But if she was aware, and if she understood the stakeholder, she would have said to her lawyers, are you insane? I'm going to ask my case manager for a year in the halfway house. I'm going to go back to the judge for a compassionate release. I got two young babies I want to get home to. I want to get off probation early. Are you insane? My family has money. They'll help me make the $250 a month payment. They send me money for commissary. Are you people nuts? Get out. Don't bill me. Don't go to the judge. Whatever he says I should pay, I will pay. Thank you. Have a nice day. I can't pay you for seven and a half years until my federal prison sentence is over. Now go market my case and go do some great TV shows and leverage off the fact that you represented Elizabeth Holmes. There's money there for you guys. Have a nice day. I'm done with you. That's what she should have said from the email system. It's what she should have said from prison. Yet, uh, she no get it. So let's wrap up this uh, video. And I appreciate some of you expressing concern. Has anyone expressed concern that I was seasick after going for a canoe ride and people thought I was dead on the beach? There's no concerns yet that I shouldn't have gone on the canoe ride. The highlight, though, is that video of my son. That was awesome. And beneath that photo is my daughter and me drinking out of a pineapple, which she let me have one sip of, not cool. Let's go to the last part here, forward thinking and strategy. Defendants need to be strategic and forward thinking. Holmes's decision to contest this payment may well come back to haunt her, damaging her prospects and reputation even more. Holmes must understand that while she has the right to appeal and profess her innocence, she cannot ignore her responsibility. Her lack of awareness and forward thinking as demonstrated by this ill-considered request only undermines her continued unwillingness to understand the perspective of all stakeholders. Successful defendants, as hard as this is, you forward think five years, 10 years, 15 years out into the future, and then reverse engineer your way back. Had she been thinking 
or resourceful or using her critical thinking skills, she would have said, 84 months, I'm going to be here seven and a half years. What can I be doing during this time to influence my case manager, my probation officer, and demonstrate to my victims that I, even though I don't agree with the version of events and I'm appealing, I know my actions have impacted them. She could do what Jennifer Shaw, with whom she is serving time at Bryan Federal Prison Camp, is doing, our client. She could be building her release plan. She could be teaching classes and inspiring and mentoring other prisoners like Jennifer is doing. She could be proving worthy of the love and support of, of her family and telling them, I'm going to need your continued support by enabling and helping me to make this restitution payment. She should be creating an agenda or plan where like, I'm going to the, I'm going back to my judge in a few months. And guess what? We believe more prison reform is coming. My mentor and business partner, Michael Santos, served 26 consecutive years in prison. He changed my life while in prison. Two weeks ago, he was featured on the homepage of the Bureau of Prisons website, talking about his 26 years in prison, talking about the work our team does in prisons and jails across the country, and they implement our programs. Elizabeth Holmes could be teaching one of those programs if she had any, any clue about what it takes to succeed while on the inside of a federal prison. She's not doing that. And it's unfortunate because she's simply making matters worse for those who love and support her. To the idea of prison reform, what if at some point they deduce that they're going to do furloughs? That would be wonderful. You sleep in the prison, but during the day you go work. Helps prioritize the victims who tend to be throwaways. She owes $452 million, as rich as they are. What if at some point in our future, because we incarcerate so many people in this country, we love to pay for it, most taxpayers don't care, and most people presume people who are in prison should be in prison until someone like me gets there and realizes, well, we lock up too many nonviolent offenders. Many of them are ready to go home, but they're trapped under these draconian sentencing laws. There is more reform coming, thanks to Colette Peters, the BOP director. And what if at some point, some point, they say, we're going to have furloughs. You sleep here, you go home. Pretty impressive. What if they come back with probation or parole, which was abolished a long, long time ago? Well, what do you think advances your agenda if you go in front of a parole board, which exists in state prisons? If Elizabeth Holmes at some point goes in front of a parole board, which could be only two or three years maybe into her 11-year sentence, does it advance her agenda if she articulates what she's done in prison, how she recognizes ain't nobody care, nobody care about her? I speak in that negative talk just for effect. I do know how to use the, I can't command the English language here. Does it help her if she says, I know people don't have sympathy for me. And I recognize that because I had opportunity that most people flush down the toilet. I had opportunity that nobody else had. I'm aware of that, which is why I've used my time in prison to build a new record, to document and teach and inspire. Wow. That's what could position her to get a potential parole if it comes back. That could position her, as I want Todd and Julie Chrisley to do. I went on Lindsay's podcast. I work with the family. Todd, build a record. Julie, build a record that could show when probation comes back why you're worthy of it. And they are doing it. Jennifer Shaw is doing it. Elizabeth Holmes, if probation comes or parole comes back, will be laughed out of the room because they're going to say, wait a second, wait a second. Are you the one that owes $452 million that you paid your lawyers $20,000 for a court hearing articulating you couldn't pay $250 a month when your family sends you $500 a month so you live comfortably in prison? That's not this Elizabeth Holmes. That's, is, do you have a twin? Is your twin also in prison? You didn't do that. Oh, you did do that. So let me understand, let me understand this. Your judge gave you 11 years in prison. You know what we consider, Ms. Holmes? The judge's sentence. Sorry you got two babies. Should have thought about that before you broke the law. Sorry you miss your fiance. Should have thought about that before you broke the law. By the way, this is what they tell us because I've been in federal prison. So this isn't conjecture or hyperbole. This is what they tell us. Should have thought about that. Further, I don't think you've created any record that demonstrates why you are worthy of leniency. I don't see it. As evidenced by this article I read the 13th of June, 2023, where you didn't want to pay $250 a month to your victims? Help me understand that. So here's what could happen sometimes while in, in prison. They can There can be repercussions. A case manager can go to fundamentally in a, in a totally different direction. So for example, how I sent extra money on probation and it brought more liberties to me, whatever I paid was worth it for the benefits that I got. On the flip side, if you are, if you express, I don't want to pay it, I ain't got it, even if the family is sending you money, and you say, well, they have money, but they're not responsible for me. If you do that, you 
you get punished, you get filleted and things could happen. They give her a worse job while in prison. Things get harder. When furloughs come and everyone's going to be running to the case manager's office, I need a furlough, I need a furlough. I got babies that want to see me. You know who they prioritize? Just like anything else in life, those that do the work, those that are honest, those that are authentic, those that are genuine, those that invest the time, those are the people that get rewarded. Did you know the Federal Bureau of Prisons only has 7,000 beds in the halfway house? Do you know how many federal prisoners? We have a lot. So how is a case manager, a stakeholder, going to deduce why someone should get three months, six months, nine months, or a year in the halfway house. It's very simple. They're going to give it to those who earn it because they have their own self-interest in play. They don't want to give it to someone who may make them look bad, who's going to violate on probation, or who is not worthy of it. And I would argue if her goal is to get out in seven and a half years, which she very well could, she is making it harder and more difficult. And there can be a general loathing and enmity that could follow from prisoners who see the resources and benefits that she has, like family visiting on every opportunity. Yet you read a headline that says she ain't got $250 a month. I think it's tragic. And that's how all, that's how I'm going to close. If you're a defendant, and I know Elizabeth Holmes is in federal prison and she's not watching this, but I know someone watching this right now is a defendant. I know what it's like to be hopeless and to be suicidal and to feel as if you've lost everything, to be forgotten about and to be ostracized. And I know even if you're not in prison right now, you feel like you are in prison. You think about it 24 hours a day. And I know once you get sentenced, the sentencing feels better than the guilty plea because at least you have clarity. And I know many of you get divorced and it's just brutal and you have no money and you don't agree with the government's version of events and you want to do over and do overs don't exist in life. I get it. What I don't want you to do is have continued regret. I don't want you to continue to move forward and then say, damn, I wish I knew this then. God, now I have more regret, more bad decisions. If you watch this video, if the only takeaway is consider the stakeholders, they don't care about you. They don't care about me. They don't. They don't. They care about the victims. They care about respecting the judge's ruling. And if you can approach it from that perspective, you're going to be more successful. If you can approach it from the perspective of I may go back to this judge and try to get out early. I want to travel on probation and work for myself, do things that might be hard, invest the time because it will all pay off. The surrendering to prison is easy. The day that you leave is difficult because you're scared of what awaits you. The real work is in between. It's like the marathon analogy I've used. Fun to start a marathon, celebrate the end. The real work and pain and agony and misery and embarrassment and humiliation and starting over and pivoting and doing work like I did on days in federal prison where I said, no one will care. No one will ever hire me. No one will piss on me if I was on fire. No woman will ever date me because I went to prison. My life is over. I said, you know what? With Michael's help, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going home. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going home at some point. I don't want this to be a life sentence. I want all of you to do what Michael did through 26 years in prison and what I did for a measly year in prison. Do the work. Put yourself in the shoes of stakeholders. Create a new record. Build, build, build. Share it. Grow your network because I love working with you. And yes, our team gets paid. And yes, I suppose I have an incentive to say this because I'd love for you to call our team and hire us. But whether you do or not, I do or don't, I care about you. I was you. And if you can do the exact opposite of Elizabeth Holmes, do the exact opposite of everything Elizabeth Holmes has done. Don't blame accept responsibility. Pay your restitution. Don't complain. Don't play dumb and act naive. Own it. Lead. Share the story and don't outsource the work. Don't outsource it to lawyers who are paid to say why you're worthy of leniency. Do the work. If you can do that, if you can do that, you will get a better outcome. If you can do that, you will have a better life after federal prison. I don't know if I'm going to film another video about Elizabeth Holmes. I made that commitment to my wife in Hawaii. Has anyone expressed any concern yet that I got terribly sick on the canoe three minutes in? There was some vomiting too. Nobody's concerned about the canoe. You just want to talk about Elizabeth Holmes. I will say as I wrap up, she is doing fine in prison. We do have clients at Brian. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to sensationalize it. What she, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it just for views, likes, or comments. I do know she's avoiding problems. I do know that she's doing her job. I knew that I do know that she really values visitation. I do know that she understands her environment. I do know that she's made some friends. I do know that some people have said she's witty, funny, likable. Others have said she's kind of like a, a chameleon. She'll tell you whatever she wants to hear. But she is avoiding some problems, which is important. I would just like, thank you, Scott, for articulating that you're happy that I'm well after nearly passing out off the canoe ride. She is doing fine in prison. She could do better.
we can all do better. I want her to do better for purposes of her victims and her family. Grateful that all of you watched on this 25 minute uh, live stream. Again, if you find value in the video, please like, subscribe and comment. Someone's asking about Ghislaine Maxwell and the 400 complaints. Let me wrap that up really quickly. <laughs> Something you should not do in federal prison is write what's called a cop out. A cop out is a request to staff. I don't like my food. I don't like the peanut butter. The avocados and the chow hall or commissary aren't that good. I want to tattletale or complain on someone. Com uh, cop outs, which Ghislaine Maxwell has written 400 of, are a terrible way. She's doing it for some reason. There there's no other reason she's writing these cop outs to either go to the hole and spend time alone or hopes that she will get transferred to another low security prison. But the BOP isn't that huge. And wherever she goes, prisoners and staff are going to know that she's written hundreds of cop outs. I filmed a, a, actually a YouTube short in Hawaii that said I was wrong. I once said that Ghislaine Maxwell, when she goes from MDC in Brooklyn to the federal prison, it will feel like Disneyland because you go from the higher security prison to a lower security prison. I was wrong because she has made like every terrible decision you can make all on the inside. To Elizabeth Holmes' credit, she does not appear to be making decisions that are making matters necessarily worse but she's not making decisions that really advance her uh, agenda. And I agree. Clearly she's doing, thank you for the canoe. Clearly uh, Maxwell did that because she wants to, she wants to be transferred. Have a wonderful weekend. Have a safe 4th of July holiday. I'm so grateful that all of you continue to return for the Elizabeth Holmes saga here on the white collar advice channel. I'm humbled and grateful that you come and I'll continue to try to provide value. Goodbye.